Dear friends and colleagues, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. I'm Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of the Washington, D.C.-based Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Uh, we are getting together today for a very special program um, addressing that very relationship that we talk about between the, uh, the security and military threats posed by North Korea and the North Korean human rights conundrum. Before I uh, introduce our most distinguished speaker, let me acknowledge uh, two board members who are in attendance, Colonel David Maxwell of uh, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and Dr. Marcus Noland of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, the virtual presence of our good friend, uh, Bill Newcomb, many other good friends, my mother joining us from Romania because she really wanted to see Professor Bruce Bechtel. Um, we have a very special guest today, Professor Bruce Bechtel, who's a professor of political science at Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas. Professor Bechtel is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, has uh, taught at uh, Marine Corps Command and Staff College, uh, the Graduate School of International Studies at Korea University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, has held uh, numerous teaching positions, uh, is a very prolific author, has published uh, dozens of uh, chapters and articles in books, journals, peer-reviewed publications. Uh, he is also, of course, very well known for the books he has authored on North Korea, and I'm going to go in reverse chronological order. His latest book is North Korean Military Proliferation in the Middle East and Africa, Enabling Violence and Instability 2018, University Press of Kentucky, obviously very close to the subject matter to be discussed today. North Korea and regional security in the Kim Jong-un era, a new international security dilemma, Paul Grave Macmillan 2014, the last days of Kim Jong-il, the North Korean threat in a changing era, 2013 Potomac books, defiant failed state, the North Korean threat to international security, Potomac books, 2010, and his first book, Red Rogue, the persistent challenge of North Korea, Potomac books, 2007. Now, let me turn it over to my good friend, Professor Bruce Bechtol. Bruce, the camera and the microphone and the stage are all yours. Thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. And uh, to all of you who uh, who tune in to hear my boring rantings, I, I, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised, but thank you for tuning in. And especially to Greg's mother, who I have never met, but I hope to meet her someday. Because um, we've met each other's families. We've met everybody else in our families except his mother, so it's, it's her turn now. Um, so let's, let's talk about uh, my latest research. Um, that's what Greg asked me to talk about. I've been working on, as Greg could probably tell you and others who are tuned in, I, I'm really a, a uh, North Korean military capabilities specialist and, uh, and have been doing that really for, for many years before I got my PhD and became a college professor. I did it at the Defense Intelligence Agency. I did it in the Marine Corps. Um, I became very concerned a few years ago about the proliferation North Korea was involved in and that very few people were talking about. And that became my focus and my obsession around 2013. And it has been that way ever since. So let me kind of lead into that. Um, every, you know, as everybody knows, big week for uh, our Secretary of State and our, uh, our Secretary of Defense. Um, over in uh, the Far East and Alaska later. Um, and we have seen leading up to this in the, the uh, really for several years, weapons tests that have included new mobile ICBMs, IRBM, SLBMs. By the way, those acronyms are just simply based on the distance that the missile flies. We've seen new submarines, uh, multiple rocket launchers that can hit far south of Seoul. Um, and other systems that, that have been far more advanced than, uh, than previously seen. Uh, they certainly are more advanced. Uh, they're not more advanced than some of the stuff we have, but they are quite advanced for uh, East Asian militaries. We've seen uh, tests of nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, 
and conventional systems. And this is all very important, but, <coughs> excuse me, if you take anything away from today's session, take away this. Every time we look at North Korea testing new weapon systems or fielding new weapon systems, we need to look at it two ways, not one. We need to look at it as a threat to the region and the USA, if used, and we need to look at it as a threat to already volatile regions, particularly in the Middle East and Africa because of proliferation. That proliferation is extensive and it is a huge part of the budget that North Korea uses to fund its military and for Kim Jong-un to take care of the elite. Um, so we are the largest regions for North Korean proliferation. As I just mentioned, it's the Middle East and Africa. And the Middle East is much bigger as far as profit making than Africa, but they sell to so many countries in Africa, a dozen, um, that they actually make several hundred million dollars a year off just Africa itself. Mostly Sub-Saharan Africa, but Egypt and Libya as well. However, they make billions, yes, billions annually from sales to the Middle East, largely Iran. Um, WMD and ballistic missile sales occur all over the Middle East, but especially Iran and Syria. Conventional weapons sales are all over the Middle East, including proxies of Iran and Syria, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and the on-again, off-again relationship that Iran has with Hamas. Um, and of course, I talked about Africa briefly. That's for another lecture. Greg ever asked me to come back if I don't get up too bad. Um, so what are North Korean? I know that, that people like uh, John Kirk are now leaning over his computer screen going, but what are North Korea's key proliferation activities, Bruce? Well, they are this, I'm going to tell you. Um, key proliferation activities. WMD and the platforms to carry it, which is largely ballistic missiles, but also artillery systems, conventional weapon systems. You know, Greg and I have talked about the fact that McBig, he's talked about the SKS a lot. North Korea makes a version of the SKS called the Type 73 machine gun. They sell it all over Africa and all over the Middle East too, Hezbollah, the Houthis, Iran, et cetera. <clears throat> Refurbishment of Soviet era weapons for countries that still use them, which is, well, everyone in the Middle East, not called Israel, okay? Nearly, I'm exaggerating a bit. Um, I'll give you an example. In the early days of the Syrian civil war, um, the Syrian army got so many tanks wiped out <clears throat> by, uh, by rebel forces, they asked the North Koreans to come over there. They were already over there for many things, but they asked them to come over there specifically with armored specialists so that they could refurbish their old T-54, 55 tanks to go out and keep fighting the rebels. Um, <clears throat> technical and military assistance and advising. This is hugely important. Let me tell you a short story and you'll see why. Um, my wife's sister is quite wealthy. Her husband's a multimillionaire. She's a professor, actually, my wife's sister. <clears throat> and she came over to the United States to do her postdoc. Well, um, when she left, she gave my wife her Lexus. I know you guys will be shocked, shocked to learn we don't have a Lexus dealership in San Angelo. Plenty of places to buy a pickup but no places to buy a Lexus. So we went up, we have a lot of Korean students here. So we drove up to Austin, it's about four hours away and uh, they went out shopping and I sat and waited in the Lexus dealership while we just got our cars standard checkup, um, you know, change the oil, the oil filter, all that stuff. So they went shopping, took a taxi back and then the Lexus dealership hands me the bill. It was $1,800. Just so you guys understand this, I'm a professor. I don't make a lot of money. It was then that I said, honey, you know, maybe, maybe you should sell the Lexus so we could get a really nice new Kia for you. But uh, at any rate, why do I tell this story? Because that's the same way it works with the North Koreans. When you sell something 
if you're a North Korean, let's say your name is Mr. Kim, and you're uh, a member of a front, you're a, me- a front company guy for Comed, right? The Korean Mining Development Company, and they have an office in Tehran. You sell the Iranians a Scud C, right? Well, you don't just sell them the Scud C. You sell them the maintenance on the Scud C, which is done by North Koreans. Then you sell them the factory that you build for the Scud C, which is supervised by Koreans. And you sell them the spare parts for that quote unquote, now indigenously produced Iranian missile that have to come in from North Korea. So if you buy a Scud C, for example, in Iran, it's like buying a Lexus, you know, from my mother, from my sister-in-law. So it's, it's uh, this key change in proliferation has been very interesting. The North Koreans now have built factories, which are really just assembly facilities, all over the Middle East and Africa, in, in Syria, Iran, um, even in Lebanon for some of the smaller conventional weapons, in Africa in such crazy places as Namibia, Uganda, and Ethiopia. So it's it's been quite the change, quite the paradigm shift to speak like a political science guy. Um, and it's helped keep them uh, from getting caught because uh, it's a lot easier to ship parts than it is home missiles. Um, let's talk about North Korean's tactics, techniques, and procedures. Or to put it simply for somebody like Don Kirk, who I believe is, is tuned in, um, how do they smuggle these things? Um, well, a lot of important stuff people don't realize. Placing proliferated items on non-DPR ships combined with legitimate cargo, which they've done over and over again, sometimes getting caught, but not most of the time. Reflagging ships, that's hugely important. What do I mean by reflagging ships? Well, in 2019, uh, the North Koreans used used uh, more than 50 Tanzanian ships, or excuse me, uh, ships that were flagged as Tanzanian ships. They've been flagged as Mongolia, uh, which, by the way, is a landlocked country, <laughs> um, and all kinds of other countries as well. This this has been a way that they've been able to sneak their stuff through. So we put sanctions on their ships. doesn't do a thing. Um, taking advantage of loose transshipment regs, issuing false cargo declarations, falsifying cargo declarations, using phony front companies to hire ships and aircraft, often through a web several layers thick, flying through China, uh, using aircraft carrying sensitive proliferated cargo to fellow rogue states. Like what? What would that be? Like missiles, like HEU parts, et cetera. So, um, you know, when we call them, what did the, one of the uh, Treasury Department guys call them recently? A criminal syndicate. <clears throat> Why do we call them that? Why do I call them that? Because they are. Um, proliferation of nuclear, um, and I'll talk about this, chemical and missile programs is by far to most policymakers the biggest threat and the largest money maker for the DPRK as well. In other words, let me give you an example of this. Um, North Korea um, sold uh a bunch of uh, rock propelled grenades to Egypt back in 2016. The ship was caught. Um, actually, we alerted the Egyptians so that they could intercept the shipment that was coming in for the Egyptians. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and of course they did because they don't want to end that, that uh, money flow of aid that comes from us. That ship had $23 million worth of RPGs on it. Um, between 2013 and 2017, North Korea made 41 shipments to Syria. So 23 million times 41, add that up. And so when you hear me say they made hundreds of millions of dollars a year off Syria, especially during the Civil War, that's why. There is no doubt about that. Um, but something else you need to understand is that um, the more sensitive the shipment is, and the more deadly, the more they're gonna charge that host state or non-state actor for it. So they're obviously gonna charge more for chemical weapons related stuff than they are for a bunch of RPGs and Type 73 machine guns. Uh, Most important customers are Iran and Syria. Um, That has included and still includes nuclear, chemical, and platforms and assembling facilities. 
also large scale assistance. In short, when a system is transferred or built, the North Korean governments and front companies are there from cradle to grave. So, Greg, I'm uh, I'm going to talk about missiles. What do you think? Does that sound good? All right. Well, it sounds like a great plan, Bruce. <laughs> Sorry to keep coughing. My uh, my wife says I smoke too much. What the hell does she know? Okay. Iran is North Korea's oldest, most robust customer when it comes to missiles and a lot of other stuff. WMD-related materials proliferation began in the early 1980s. North Korea proliferated its first SCUDs to Egypt, Scud Bs, in the early 1980s, and they were used against Iraq in the War of the Cities, of course. They have now sold Iran Scud B, C, D, E, R, Nodong, Musudan, and likely te Tapodong technology, as well as technology from their very latest missile tests. Um, in 2009, Greg and I were actually at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, and uh, I gave a, a uh, I was a panelist where I gave a short paper on what had just happened with the test that uh, um, North Korea had made with what they called the UNHA. Um, at that time, I said what I had read in the press in several places, that Iranians were present at that test, as they had been at several others. Um, some guy from one of the press outlets uh, asked a question. He said, well, I've been told by my government source that the Iranians were not there. And of course, my answer was, first of all, what the hell is a government source doing commenting on something like that to you from the intelligence community? Bad form. Secondly, I'll bet you in a few years, we'll see the evidence that the Iranians were there. Well, here goes. In 2009, the North Koreans launched a missile, and then they successfully launched it. It, it crashed in 2009, but later they successfully launched a three-stage ballistic missile with the first stage being a cluster of four Nodong engines. A few years later, the North Koreans, excuse me, the Iranians tested the Samorg space launch vehicle. And the first stage of that missile was four clustered Nodong engines. One of the analysts from the Institute at Middlebury College actually commented in his piece that this may be related to a North Korean missile, you think? So anyway, um, we see this all over the place. North Korea is knee deep in any kind of liquid fuel missile, just about most of them that uh, Iran has. Iranian engineers, technicians, VIPs have been present at nearly every North Korean ballistic missile test. Um, and as I said before, North Korea um, has assisted Iran and not assisted, they did it. They built fabrication facilities now for Scud B, Cs. The D facilities are in Syria, but they share them with Iran, the Nodon, um, and the uh, Musadon, um, so, which is called the Karamshar in Iran. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I do speak very badly a Middle Eastern language. It's not Arabic. Um, they have also assisted Tehran in the construction and the flight of the Saphir. Well, if you look at the Saphir, the indigenously produced missile by the Iranians, well, the first stage of the Saphir is a nodong. Um, missile steering engines also came from uh, the North Koreans. Um, <clears throat> as of yet, we have not seen North Korea assisting Iran in solid fuel mission uh, uh, missiles very much, but then the, the Iranians don't fly solid fuel missiles very much. Um, now that the uh, North Koreans have the Poguk Song uh, missile series, three of those are launched by submarine, one is launched by land. You could probably expect to see those um, in Iran soon because if you see it in North Korea today, you'll see it in Iran tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story, a true story, about uh, about the latest missile um, missile thing that deals with uh, deals with North Korea. 
So in 2013, this is about how North Korea was able to sell Iran an ICBM. Let me repeat that. In Morse code, as you know, that would be repeat an ICBM. Okay. According to press reports in 2013, North Koreans were developing um, and assisting the Iranians with development of an 80 ton rocket booster. In 2015, Further developments were revealed in the press when it was disclosed that several shipments of the aforementioned rocket from North Korea to Iran had occurred, even as J.C. Poa talks were ongoing. Big surprise. Right at, coincidentally, right after the talks finished in the fall of 2016 and, and 2015, in 2016, the U.S. Treasury Department imposed sanctions on Iranian companies and individuals for violations of sanctions imposed on North Korea. To put a finer point on it, North Korean and Iranian officials had visited both nations. This was done so that Iran could procure an 80-ton rocket booster for a missile that North Korea was developing at the time. If anyone wants to look at that, they can A, read several articles I've written or go back and read the Treasury reports. In 2017, a year later, roughly a year and a half, on the same day my baby girl, the apple of my eye, the center of my life, graduated from the University of Iowa, May 13th, 2017, North Korea tested what they called the Hwasong-12. This missile is an IRBM with a range of 4,500 kilometers. It turns out the Hwasong-12 is powered by a rocket engine probably procured from the Ukrainians. According to the Ukrainians, it was either illegally, under the table, unknown to officials, or just not at all. Well, it couldn't be not at all since they're flying it, right? Um, this engine is reportedly powered by 80 tons of thrust at sea level, and thus is probably the 80-ton rocket booster we kept seeing in reports um, that people in Washington were frequently poo-pooing. Um, later, during 2017, North Korea tested two ICBMs, the Hwasong-14, which could hit Alaska, the West Coast, and the Hwasong-15, which many projected could hit the East Coast. Both of these two-stage missiles, the first stage on them was the Hwasong-14, powered by Eighty tons of thrust, as I've said, like what, fourteen times now. Um, so it now appears that the missile that they were working on um, was, in fact, what we saw in North Korea as a Hwasong twelve, updated to the Hwasong fourteen, updated to the Hwasong fifteen. Okay, but wait, there's more. Uh, in October 2020, the long UN embargo on Iranians' weapons trade ended. This opened the way for a military component of the already announced 25-year deal between China and Iran starting in November of that year. It now appears, and this is according to three different sources that I have, but reported in the press as well, that as part of the military component of China's new military deal with Iran, North Korea will reportedly also provide conventional weapons and technology for missiles to Tehran. These will be paid for um, with Iranian oil. Anybody who's been following North Korea knows they need oil. North Korea is reported to be providing among its weapons and technology support, the Hwasong-12 and probably the 14 and 15 as well. This confirms what, if one is to connect the dots, started being reported in 2013. 2013. Um, but now it appears that a more long-term deal on these and other systems is being brokered with Chinese support. The liquid power engines are most likely to be what will be used in the second stage of an ICBM, just as North Korea has used these engines to power the second stages of the 14 and 15. Reportedly, Iran will call this system a space launch vehicle. Okay. North Korea has already launched it as a missile. Okay, so the world should know better. Um, 
Thus, according to press sources and other sources that at least for now remain anonymous, except for the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China, who acknowledged this and said it was a great concern two months ago when we talked to him. Um, what we are seeing now is a triangular, long-term deal involving Iran, China, and North Korea. What does this mean? This long-term sales relationship between North Korea and Iran has been ongoing and well-known since the early 1980s. Now it appears China is going to be part of that as well, at least when it comes to Iran. One would have thought that China and perhaps Russia, openly being willing to sell sophisticated systems to Iran, would push North Korea out as one of Iran's major military benefactors. Instead, it appears that China's new and profitable relationship with Iran will actually enable continued North Korean arms sales to Tehran. While China and Russia, perhaps, are likely to be selling such things as sophisticated aircraft, upgraded tanks, modernized command and control systems, North Korea could still politically proliferate such things as small arms, military training for both the Iranians and the proxy groups they support, and of course, ballistic missiles. So what I'm telling you here, folks, is um, this relationship started in the 1980s. It hasn't stopped ever. It has been a huge and profitable relationship for these two countries, and it is ongoing as of right now. Um, so, um, I'll just briefly talk about um, the uh, sale of, of uh, nuclear and chemical programs. When it comes to Iran, uh, North Korea has sold their chemical programs to Iran roughly since at least they were selling them to uh, Syria, which is the early 1990s, right after the Gulf War is when that started. Uh, and we'll talk more about um, um, the uh, other programs later. What about conventional weapons? Well, North Korea has sold submarines. Um, they've also sold catamaran hold ships to, uh, to Iran. Um, the ship, uh, excuse me, the submarine that sank the Chonan in 2010 was a submarine, um, which was originally built for Iran. And North Korea liked it, and they're, and they're using that themselves as well, obviously in a very deadly way. Um, they sell all kinds of conventional weapons to Iran. A lot of those get passed on or deals are worked out between the IRGC and the North Koreans to directly sell to these state and non-state actors. Um, Iran supports much of North Korea's, excuse me, much of uh, Syria's weapons acquisition, much of Hezbollah's weapons acquisition, most of the Houthis' weapons ac acquisition, et cetera. Guns, tanks, um, RPGs, artillery, all that stuff. Uh, North Korea sells all that kind of stuff to those guys. Uh, and what we've seen gradually has been, it starts off North Korea going through the IRGC to these entities, and then it eventually ends up North Korean front companies are hooked up by the Iranians with these with people like Hezbollah, the Houthis, and start making deals with them directly. So uh, very interesting stuff. Let's talk about North Korean proliferation to Syria much more quickly since Greg is frowning at me, wants me to shut up pretty soon. Um, everybody knows about the Syrian facility built by the North Koreans, destroyed by my cousins in Israel in 2007. Um, the facility was, according to um, Iran's former deputy minister of defense, a member of the IRGC who defected, um, back in 2008, the Iranians paid the North Koreans $2 billion, at least, to build that facility. Um, and a briefing given by the, national, uh, the, by the Director of National Intelligence in 2008 gives a lot of great details if you want to go online and, and see that. North Korea built Syria's chemical weapons facilities, some of which are located near Aleppo, as many of you know. Um, North Korean advisors are currently and throughout the Syrian civil war supporting the production of those facilities, um, assisting with mating weapons to platforms. I actually had advisors out on the field with the Syrian missile and artillery units. And the North Koreans 
I know this for a fact because I saw it even before I became a professor, long before the Syrian Civil War began. <laughs> North Korea would send over artillery and chemical weapons officers every year to do an annual exercise with the Syrian army where they use live munitions. I'm not kidding. Can you imagine, Greg, or any of the rest of you who are veterans, us doing an exercise with live chemical weapons? Yeah, you'd have a, a lot of um, uh, people running off. But uh, that's what they did every year with the Syrians. Um, they supplied them. They set up the facilities that uh, that manufactured those those weapons, um, and they sent over many spare parts. Obviously, and continued that throughout the war. Um, so they were at the point that when the Syrian civil war really kicked off in 2011, um, the Syrian army was already ready to use those weapons against its own people because the North Koreans had trained them for about 10 years. So very compelling stuff. By the way, the 122 millimeter MRLs that the mobile rocket launchers, that the North Koreans attacked Yanpyong Do with in November of 2010, those are the same systems that the Syrians use to launch chemical weapons at their own people, or one of them. They also used obviously scuds and they barrel bombs, they dropped out of helicopters. Um, so the North Koreans were literally able to train in a live combat environment with the systems they were assisting the Syrians with, which makes them more ready if there's ever a war with the South. So kind of a chilling thought. Um, listen, missiles, Syria had the Scud B, C, and D. Um, they continue to work on the Scud D to make it more accurate and to improve its range. Uh, much of the testing of the missiles is collaborative with the Iranians and the Syrians have given some of those missiles to Hezbollah. So we got that going for us. Um, let's talk about conventional weapons to Syria. Artillery, MRLs, tanks, anti-tank weapons, radars, and a variety of small arms. North Korean pilots reportedly were flying missions for the Syrian air force during the civil war. North Koreans were operating a command and control center for the Iranians to support the Syrian military in Damascus and North Koreans advisors, even as the war was ongoing. And now we're assisting the Syrian army with training on several conventional systems. In short, the Syrian civil war has been a huge and profitable effort for the DPRK arms industry. Let's talk about Hezbollah briefly. Proliferation of Hezbollah has been going on since the 1980s as well. This includes arm sales, training, and construction of underground facilities. Back in the Hezbollah-Israeli war, the Israelis couldn't figure out why the Hezbollah would suddenly disappear, the fighters. Well, because they had a incredibly complex underground facilities built for them by the North Koreans. North Korea has also sold rockets to Hezbollah and many weapon sales to Iran have been specifically for Hezbollah fighters. What about the Houthis? Houthis are using ballistic missiles supplied by Iran, or at least that's how it started off, uh, but had their genesis in North Korea. Um, I've actually got pictures of Houthis with Type 73 machine guns. Um, since that time, in 2000, beginning in 2019, um, as I said, the IRGC set up the North Koreans and the Houthis so that the North Koreans can now sell the Houthis um, uh, conventional weapons, <coughs> excuse me, and ballistic missiles capable of hitting Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, by the way, um, directly. Um, probably paid for by Iran, though. Um, Hamas. Um, there, there's a lot of analysis that, that, that points to the uh, assessment that their tunnels in 2014 were built by, uh, by the North Koreans, or they were trained to build them by the North Koreans. Lots and lots of rockets purchased by the North Koreans and a lot of training. Um, so this all is, continues to go on. Um, I'm not going to say Iran is paying for everything that its proxies are doing. 
Obviously, Hezbollah has its own illicit network that they use to set up things, uh, but they're paying for a lot of it. And so, you know, after you fight a war like the civil war in Syria, then you need to rebuild your military and your facilities. That's going on right now. There are workers rebuilding military facilities from North Korea in Syria right now. Um, and the work on missiles, rockets, um, naval acquisition, et cetera, continues to go on in Iran right now. So if you read in Reuters that activity between North Korea and as Iran has resumed, I would say two things. One, please read the UN panel of experts reports. And two, when did it stop? It didn't. So here's my assessments, and then I'll get off the line so Greg can uh, critique my, uh, my uh, whoops, what happened? So Greg can critique, surprise, so Greg can critique my, uh, my rantings, as he always does. North Korean assistance has been the key factor in the rapid development and capabilities of Iran's ballistic missile development, period, okay? North Korea's assistance has facilitated Iran's HEU program, including the building of underground facilities that protect against bunker buster munitions, according to anecdotal data. You want to know more about that? Ask me the question, and I'll go through it later, okay? The Syrian civil war has been a boost for North Korea's sales of chemical weapons, ballistic missiles, armor, artillery, small arms, and training efforts, adding badly needed funds to the uh, KWP and Kim Jong-un slush funds. Finally, North Korea's sales and assistance to Hezbollah, the Houthis, and Hamas have served to enable the threat against Israel and to provide fighters to Syria. And that's all I got to say, except go buy my latest book. It's on Amazon.com, 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 North Korean Military Proliferation in the Middle East in Africa. Floor is yours, sir. Bruce, Dr. Bechtol, sir, thank you so much. Fantastic lecture. Before we move <coughs> on to the Q&A, and I would like to remind you the best way to ask questions is by means of using the chat function or the Q&A function. Let me also acknowledge the presence of Lieutenant General uh, Gregson, who is a former Assistant Secretary of Defense, Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, and of course, uh, a former commander of US Marine Forces Pacific, a uh, great friend of Bruce and mine and ours. Um, before we move um, on to the q and I will keep my remarks really brief. Uh, the big challenge for human rights organizations is that human rights is often outcompeted by other um, very serious concerns. Uh, North Korea has nuclear weapons, ballistic missiles, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation of uh, instability and violence. And the, the North Korean threat, as uh, Dr. Bechtel uh, points out, goes way beyond the Northeast Asia region, the Indo-Pacific, uh, all the way to the Middle East. Uh, the issues that Dr. Bechtel raises Many of these issues are certainly at the confluence of political security, military issues, and human rights. For example, um, one, uh, in one instance, that of uh, North Korean chemical weapons specialists actually conducting training using live chemical weapons in Syria, weapons that were later used against uh, civilians. Uh, in addition to the, the proliferation and illicit sales of missiles, missile parts, top type 73 submachine guns and other weaponry and tools of death, of course, there's another issue that's also at the intersection of uh, illicit exports, the security threat and human rights violations, and that is the exportation of North Korean workers overseas. The North Korean regime, very keen on its survival, um, oppresses and exploits its own people at home and abroad. Of course, uh, there was a UN Security Council resolution, resolution 2371 on August 5th, 2017, that called for a ban on the hiring and paying of additional North Korean laborers used to generate foreign export earnings 
what we knew before that resolution, according to uh, our own um, Department of State and the report on human rights in the DPRK was that prior to that resolution, prior to COVID, there were about 100,000 workers dispatched to about 40 countries all around the world with the main destinations being China, Russia, and also the Middle East. We were able to document and confirm the presence of thousands of North Korean construction workers in Kuwait, for example, thousands of construction workers and some healthcare workers in Qatar, uh, in the UAE, in construction. Remember, North Korean workers uh, worked on a soccer World Cup stadium construction, both in Russia and in Qatar. Of course, North Korean workers were dispatched to a multitude of African countries, most recently Angola, um, Algeria as well. Um, we have interviewed uh, many of these uh, former construction workers, some of them who escaped. I, I recall uh, speaking to the former construction worker in the Middle East who, who told me, quote unquote, we were slaves. Bangladeshi workers doing similar work got paid $450 a month on average. We also did earn the same amount, but it just all went to the workers' party. But all families at home are still waiting in the hope of getting at least one TV set when the fathers come back. Uh, these workers were told under the previous leadership of Kim Jong-il, uh, again, quote unquote, back in our homeland, people are starving. We are blessed by the general to be out there and have white rice and beef soup every day. We should thank him for everything we have here. That was life at our construction site in the Middle East. So we have been able to thoroughly document all types of labor violations from wage violations, the confiscation of up to 90% of the money these workers earn to um, severe um, workplace uh, safety and health violations, uh, working hours violations, uh, workers telling us that in the Middle East, their morning shift was from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m., lunch break for one hour, then again, five more hours um, and a dinner break, uh, ideological training. So they would work for 13 to 14 hours a day with no holidays. Um, so again, uh, what is the point of this exercise, bringing together the two sets of issues? For three years in a row, the UN Security Council failed to place North Korean human rights on its agenda. It had done it before under two different US administrations, uh, the two previous administrations. Um, we, we see encouraging signs. There was a letter co-signed by 24 UN member states, an effort led by Germany um, that uh, requested the president of the Security Council to keep the issue on the agenda, because if you don't take it up for three years, what happens is that it falls off the agenda. So our tall order and very difficult mission is to continue to highlight the uh, interconnectivity between the, the security and military threats that North Korea poses and the very nature of a regime whose modus operandi is to rely on oppressing and exploiting its own people at home and abroad. And that said, I see that we already have two questions and one comes from none other than our good friend, Colonel David Maxwell, HRNK board member. Uh, Bruce, uh, Dave's question is, uh, why have we been apparently so reluctant to try to stop North Korean proliferation given the conflicts it contributes to and, and, and given to how much this proliferation supports the regime, uh, what are some of the concerted actions we should take to counter North Korean proliferation? Back to you, Bruce. First of all, great thoughts, Greg, on the human rights issues over there, which are all true and, and ongoing. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I think it, your background would look much better if you had Masada in back of you into the HR. Okay. Uh, Rosa, could you fix that for us, please? Okay. Um, so I think you're reading the same question that I read. There you go. There's Masada. Greg and I toured Masada in 2019 uh, when we were over there for a conference. 
That was too brief, Rosa. What's wrong with you? Okay. Uh, uh, the question about we have been reluctant to stop North Korean proliferation. Let's go all the way back to, uh, to uh, when I was at DIA in the late 1990s, when Clinton was president. Um, they were reluctant to stop it then, and I knew this for a fact, because of the fact that they, were, uh, they felt things were so sensitive at Yongbyon and the light water reactors, et cetera. Um, and so it just wasn't something that was talked about. Um, in, at least, at least a year before the end of, uh, of the Clinton administration, in fact, they knew about um, the HEU proliferation that was going back and forth, you know, missiles for a nuke deal that was going back and forth between Pakistan and North Korea and did nothing, nothing. Nobody knew about it. The Bush administration finally made it public. Um, and if you think that I'm exaggerating on this, I encourage you to go read the readings by either Robert Gallucci, a Democrat who was in the administration, or by Victor Cha, the Republican who came in and, and was handed, well, this is going on. Well, take it easy. Um, so, I mean, um, that, was, that was a hesitancy in the Clinton administration. In the Bush administration, and hesitancy occurred certainly in the last 18 months or so of the administration with what we now pretty widely acknowledge were the failed uh, talks, the, the failed uh, initiatives of Chris Hill, Condoleezza Rice, and others, who I, I won't mention. Um, but uh, they were very hesitant to, to, and by then it was very obvious, they were very hesitant to shut down such things as, you know, um, um, you know, um, the ballistic missiles that were going over there, et cetera. Um, uh, in fact, it was about almost a year, and perhaps others can jump in on this, it was almost a year after the Israelis bombed that facility in the desert in northern Syria before the Bush administration came out and actually gave a, uh, an unclassified report on that. I, I, I would have liked to have seen that a lot sooner. That's just me. Um, in the Obama administration, Starting in 2013, we're seeing these reports from Bill Gertz, who people on the left are poo-pooing, ah, he writes for the Washington Free Beacon, blah, 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 blah. Um, at the same time, these, the, this North Korea is supplying and helping and aiding the, the Iranians for a lot of money and oil in building an ICBM. Completely gets it, get nothing mentioned. Nothing mentioned by the Obama administration until 2016, after the JCPOA was signed. Um, so then we get to Trump, and and Trump also. Um, my understanding is again, I was not an advisor to Trump. I am but a lowly college professor in West Texas. But um, you know, my understanding is there was a lot of proliferation, a lot of dirty money flowing through banks that could have been highlighted, could have been sanctioned, or at least the banks could have been fined, but it was not. Again, for fear of putting too much pressure on North Korea because they might walk away, which has always been a great ploy and great leverage for the North Koreans with us. So that's, you know, you asked me what time it was and I built a watch for you, but uh, um, I will tell you what we can do, what Biden can do, whether he will do that or not, we don't know. Um, the proliferation security in initiative, great thing, looks great, very symbolic. You know, that's a drop in a bucket. The way to get to kill a snake, I, I'm here in Texas. People out here in Texas say, you want to kill a snake, cut off its head. Um, so, I mean, you want to do that to the North Koreans, go after the dirty money. Go after the banks, the front companies, the illicit financial networks, and that will put a real hurt locker on the North Korea, trying to get their stuff out to, to places like Iran and Syria and trying to get the money back. And let me tell you why this is so difficult to do. In 2017, North Korea financed one of the many purchases that, are, that Syria had made. Um, this, they got the, or the Syrians got directly from the North Koreans, financed by Iran, Mortars, artillery, um, all kinds of weapons, 
and and chemical precursors from the North Koreans worth worth uh, I I think it was around thirty four million dollars. The money went from an Iranian bank to a North Korean front company where they were co-owners of the company with Malaysian citizens, went from that front company to be invested in a casino in Macau. Now, I, I, you know, I was informed of this from one of my sources in South Korea, and when he told me this, my answer was, gee whiz. I mean, that's a complicated several layers network. That's what we're up against. But if we're not willing to go after that, North Korea is going to be able to continue to do this because you go after the head get to get the whole snake. And I hope that answered the question. Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, next, a great question from uh, Lieutenant Gerald Gregson, combining both sets of issues. First and foremost, he looks forward to going back to normal and seeing you face to face in person. Lieutenant General Gregson asks, uh, the assassination of Kim's half-brother in Kuala Lumpur seemed to be a North, uh, demonstration of North Korea's ability to deploy and employ a deadly chemical weapon. Was this also a notice to countries hosting North Korean laborers that North Korea could reach out and hurt nations who send their laborers home? Great question, General. And, and again, nice, nice to uh, have contact with you. It's been about a year or so since COVID. Um, I don't know. Greg could comment on how many North Korean laborers there are in Malaysia. Um, that's more his thing, and, and he's the best at it. But I could tell you that with Malaysia, the relationship is much more about front companies than anything else. Uh, they don't sell anything to Malaysia. They've got all these hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of front companies, many of them co-owned with, with uh, Malaysian citizens, private citizens, and, uh, and it is unbelievably easy for a North Korean official to, uh, to get into Malaysia and stay there. Very lax visa requirements. It, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it just, it's just strange. And, and when I first started researching this and realized that Malaysia's relationship with North Korea was much more cozy than most people realize, I, I asked my good friend in Korea, who has been to Malaysia probably 50 times researching this, uh, Soon Jae, I, I asked him, you know, why in the world is this going on over there? And the government's not doing anything about it. They have laws, they just don't follow them. They don't enforce them. And he said, the North Koreans have a lot of these officials bought off. So something to keep in mind. So Greg could comment better than I could on, on how this affects, because I don't even know how many workers they have over there. It's more a financial thing as far as I've seen. But I, I, I will tell you this, um, it was most definitely a warning to the world. They didn't have to kill them using a chemical weapon. They could have picked about, you know, 70 other ways to kill them. Instead, they killed them with a chemical weapon, which is not only, you know, uh, you know, in the face of, of uh, you know, the, the free world and the globalized society that we all live in, but it shows that uh, they wanted him to die in pain, which he did. Um, so I think that's very important. The last thing, General, on that, um, uh, everybody saw on TV and it was all over the news about how the Malaysians kicked the North Koreans out and shut down the embassy and blah, blah, blah. That only lasted for a few months. They came back and they're back under the same lax rules they were before. None of that's been talked about, but that's a fact. So, um, you know, something to be concerned about. Malaysia is a country that, uh, not the country itself, although there's corruption there. North Korea's activities in Malaysia are, in, are something I think we should be very concerned about. And I hope that answers your question. And uh, Bruce, uh, pre-2017 UN Security Council resolution, pre-COVID, we documented the presence of about 400 North Korean workers in Malaysia, mostly working in construction and IT. Of course, these are the ones we knew about. Remember, after the assassination of Kim Jong-nam, they took hostage uh, Malaysian nationals in North Korea, including diplomats, uh, eventually, they, they let them go. The body of Kim Jong-nam was sent back, and even a member of the assassination squad could uh, could leave freely. 
Uh, relations seem to have gone pretty much back to normal right now, uh, to the, the status quo ante, and uh, that's where we stand. The time is short, and I'm going to take the two final questions, bundle them together. One comes from uh, Dave Maxwell, from Colonel Maxwell, uh, to follow up again on both sets of issues. Don't those same banks and same North Korean front companies also contribute to both human rights abuses, and in particular, North Korean overseas slave labor and the proliferation of, of violence and instability. So would those be the same financial institutions, the same banks, the same front companies? The other well, question comes from well, our own, from Sophia Happen. How can the Biden administration pursue a new Iran nuclear deal that effectively combats the Iran-Syria-North Korea nexus? Well, let me go over Dave's question first, if I may. Um, as you and Dave both know, I think General Gregson knows a lot about this too. Um, those front companies, to them, no, I mean, there are front companies that are essentially owned by, you know, like the Reconnaissance General Bureau, several, um, and other military entities. It's not just them. Um, and there are front companies that specialize in military things, such as COMID, the, the uh, Korean Mining Development Company. But to the North Koreans, um, military arms sales or, you know, the slave labor that they have all, all over the Middle East and other places, Russia, China, those are both just things to make money off of. And where does all that money go? You know, you know, Greg, it's office number 39. You know, and we've talked to guys like Kim Kwong Jin, whose wife is a good friend of my wife. We know this, but they look at the arms industry and, it, and that's, by the way, the biggest money maker, still bigger than cyber. Cyber's come in and it's making money for them now because they're ripping off banks and stuff, but they're still making more off arms sales and the associated things that come with that than anything else. Um, including the, the uh, slave labor that they use. So do these front companies get involved in it? There, there can be no doubt. They, they, they are involved in it. Now, is it COMID, for example, in, in Tehran? Or, or um, there was another company there, the name escapes me, that they had in Tehran. These two companies have offices in Tehran. Do they primarily deal with things like bringing over labor to work in Iran? Probably not, but, you know, as you, you heard me say earlier, the, the North Koreans have been building a lot of facilities in Iran. you got to bring over labor to do that. So these front companies would be the ones that would have to do that. So there can be no doubt that they're involved in that, some more than others. But, you know, to the North Koreans, again, selling Type 73 machine guns or, you know, Scud C missiles or counterfeiting, or slave labor, or you know, um, you know, rhinoceros horns out of Tanzania. To them, that's all just things they're selling so they can contribute money for the regime. I hope that answers that question. Now, the question about Biden, what was that again, please? I can't hear you. It was about addressing the nexus, Iran, Syria, North Korea. Okay, um, that is, that's difficult. Um, first of all, the best way to do that is what we did before and what we stopped when we brought in the JCPOA and what we resumed uh, after that when, when you know, when uh, the former president came in, Trump, and, and actually uh, put a halt to the JCPOA. Um, and that's sanctions. Um, because um, what the Iranians have done regarding our activities with North Korea and the Syrians as well, it simply denied them. I mean, all this stuff going on in Syria, you know, chemical weapons proliferation and, and artillery and military advisors and all that stuff. And when North Korea was, or excuse me, when Syria was confronted with that from the UN, their answer was uh, the North Koreans are over here as sports advisors. Really? So I guess, you know, warfare must be a sport, but uh, I mean, they have basically either responded very negatively or not responded at all. Um, and it's hard to deal with, with their proxies like Hezbollah 
and you know the Shiite groups in Iraq and Iraq and and the Houthis because they're not nation states, so they're following a, they're not following the same sets of rules nation states are. What does work is sanctions and enforcing sanctions, and I, I would just say um, that that is the key: keeping those sanctions on, enforcing them, working with our international allies is a must. And, and I would say that that's something we also need to do with North Korea is not only have those sanctions on, but making sure that enforcement is the focus of those sanctions and that we work closely with our allies to take care of that. Bruce, Dr. Bechtol, thank you very much for having been so generous with your time and expertise. Uh, we will make sure to, to follow your work and your research, read your next book, which is in the works, I understand. So thank you. And before I conclude, uh, let me remind everyone that next week, a week from now, uh, again, 4 p.m., uh, we will be having a uh, program featuring the North Korean refugee issue, the slow motion North Korean refugee crisis featuring Roberta Cohen, our co-chair emeritus, and Tom Barker, member of the HRNK Board of Directors. Professor Bechtel, Dr. Bechtel, Bruce, thank you very much. We uh, greatly appreciate it. And I, I look forward to staying in touch and continuing to highlight issues of common interest. A real round of applause. And, uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person and look forward to featuring you at an in-person event at our new home. Thank you for hosting me, Greg. And thanks to everybody who showed up.